Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the Cancer Patient Lab. Uh, today I'm hosting on behalf of uh, Brad Power and uh, Roger Royce is actually going to, to be the host. Um, so I'm just gonna start us off here with uh, just um, so, some basic disclaimers uh, to let you know that um, the information and opinions that are gonna be expressed today <clears throat> Um, are not intended to be healthcare recommendations or medical advice by the Cancer Patient Lab, its principals, presenters, participants, or representative for any medical treatment product or course of action. You should always consult your doctor uh, before pursuing any type of uh, healthcare program. Also remember this is a recorded session. If you don't want to be recorded, you may uh, exit now or you can change your name and your, um, and your, uh, your Zoom or uh, you can go uh, dark if you wanna do that as well. Um, but in any event, we hope that you'll stay with us. Uh, we think this is gonna be um, an informative session. And Roger, I will turn it over to you. Okay, well, thanks a lot uh, <clears throat> for the introduction. So uh, today's presenter, Matthew Doms, uh, is going to tell us all about uh, a really interesting therapy through in Japan. Now I'll tell you, I met Matthew probably a year ago now on a through a Facebook group. It was a long, circuitous, yeah. difficult uh way to get to him. And um, I was very interested in immunotherapy at the time, and I was trying to find places that would offer it since you know we're in the US and we got the FDA to deal with. And also some other other types of, of therapies beyond standard of care. And that's when I came across uh, Matthew's group, Facebook group, uh, where it describes the kind of stuff they do in Japan, NK cell expansion, dendritic expansion. And I've actually been there twice now this last year. Uh, and I did get uh, all of the above plus some other things, uh, but most importantly, the uh, neoantigen peptide vaccine. So, um, and, uh, and I've got on a parallel track, I've got that being produced here, but like I say, things just move at a snail's pace here because of FDA rules, and that you were able to do it quickly and for a fraction of the cost. I think you'll find Matthew's story to be really interesting, um, and I'll let him tell you. I don't want to steal any of his thunder, uh, but I can tell you that this has been really, um, you know, one of the cornerstones of my treatment. Uh, I'm really glad that I found it. So with that, Matt, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. Um, I'm going to briefly just tell my story, talk a bit about how the treatment works, okay? Um, but before we do that, um, first of all, can you just type yes in the chat if you can see me and hear me okay? It's also a good way of proving that you know where the chat is. Okay, Brian, Roger, yep. David, thanks. Oh, excellent, yep. It has some noise in the background. Um, yeah, if you're in a noisy environment, please just stick yourself on mute. Um, uh, Sally, are you with us? You can't. Ah, uh, yes. Sorry, I'm on the phone, so I can't. Okay, type. no problem at all. That's cool. Um, so if you look in the chat, um, I've put my website address, email address, and YouTube channel there. Um, so do email me if you want uh, to ask any questions or if you want help coming to Japan to have the treatment that I've had. So my story um, starts in 2016. In uh, July, I was 36, suddenly diagnosed with um, stage four colon cancer, so terminal cancer. And at the time of diagnosis, it had spread to the abdominal membrane, the um, peritoneum. I didn't know we had a abdominal membrane. <laughs> um, but apparently when the cancer is in the abdominal membrane, the prognosis is very poor. Uh, the, there's not a very good blood supply to the tumors on the membrane. So chemo drugs just didn't really get in. It's a bit like with brain cancer, you've got that, uh, doctors talk about the, like the blood brain barrier. So you have the same kind of situation with the peritoneum. 
And also it's difficult to see what's going on because tumors on the peritoneum don't show up well on scans. Uh, you tend to get lots of small tumors spread over. So when I looked at the stats, with standard treatment in 2016 in Europe at that time, uh, so colon cancer, even um, stage four, prognosis was kind of okay. Well, okay, relatively speaking. So after five years, maybe 10% of people still alive. But if it spread to the abdominal membrane, that figure dropped to less than 1%. Um, so around five years, you had like half a percent people alive. Now, that's based on five-year survival data. So that would mean, you know, roughly data starting in 2011. So now we can go back and like recalculate that and see in 2016, people in my situation, how long did they actually live? And it turns out instead of seven to nine months, it's closer to about 12 months, possibly 15 months. And I'm talking with treatment, like with successful surgery and uh, chemo. So this was not good. Um, and I had uh, two young kids. And um, yeah, I thought it was probably a good idea to study oncology and uh, find out if there are any options. So that's what I did. And I'd been spending my time kind of dividing my time between the UK and Japan, or they're mainly Japan, um, for the previous sort of eight years, I guess. So it was relatively straightforward just to, uh, although I was diagnosed in the UK, jump back on a plane, head back to uh, Tokyo and start treatment. And that was just because the standard care in Japan is much higher. Um, so standard care in Japan for cancer is probably just a few years ahead of the US, but maybe 10 years ahead of the UK. Um, also, and this is kind of an important point, uh, in Japan, medical mistakes are very rare. Um, in the US, if we believe the data, medical mistakes are the third biggest killer. Um, and the reason this is important in, in the context of cancer treatment is that often we're looking at treatments that give us a few percent um, advantage or a combination of treatments that you know gives us a, a slightly bigger chance um, at over standard care. So if you're in a country where care is very variable or there's lots of mistakes, uh, or in the UK, there are medical mistakes, but there's also a lot of waiting, that eats away that advantage, right? Does that make sense, right? If, if, you're, in a, if you're in a place where uh, um, the, you know, there's a certain chance of your blood test getting mixed up or being given the wrong drug or whatever, that's that suddenly cut out that 10% advantage over standard care or whatever that you were getting. So I, I was just coming to have treatment in Japan because I knew the, the standard cancer care was very good here. Um, you know, expecting maybe I could, yeah, hope, hoping to, to live a year um, with all the treatment. But what happened was um, I heard that the Japanese were doing this kind of immunotherapy that I'd read about in other places as well. So this is um, adoptive cell transfer immunotherapy. And it's very different from the immunotherapy you've probably heard of in the media, like um, the checkpoint inhibitors like uh, Optivo and uh, Keytruda that you get a lot of media attention. This is very different because this involves um, putting cells in your body. So putting white blood cells in your body. And in Japan, they use a combination of various kinds of white blood cells. And I'll explain about those cells in a minute. 
but also this is different from you may have heard CAR T cell therapy. Uh, so CAR T cell therapy is also a type of adoptive cell transfer therapy. So you're putting white blood cells in into the blood, right? But with CAR T cell, um, you're getting T cells, which are a type of white blood cell, and you are genetically engineering them to match the patient's, um, the, the genetics of the patient's cancer, which is very good because they're very highly targeted. However, there are a couple of issues um, and the issues are that your body has a high chance of um, reacting against the cancer uh, against the therapy because these are foreign cells being put into you and also t cells are only able to attack um cancer cells that are labeled as cancer cells right so they're they're a type of white blood cell but t cells can only attack labeled cells so the cells have to be labeled with an antigen or a neo antigen um there's just a question in the chat which i will address because it's an excellent question Please be specific as to what type of cancer and what stage. So the, the, my cancer, stage four colon cancer spread to the abdominal membrane. It makes a huge difference and cannot be generalized. Um, so no, the, the, the whole point of this talk is that uh, I'm talking about a can cancer agnostic treatment. So cancer agnostic treatment means good response over all cancer types. This is very different from like tumor agnostic treatment or um, tissue, it's sometimes called tissue agnostic treatment. So I'll, ex I'll explain those briefly because I think it is, is relevant. Th thanks for your question, Paul. So tumor agnostic treatment, also called tissue agnostic treatment, means treatment that is not um, match to a specific uh, cancer origin, like lung cancer, breast cancer, bowel cancer. But tumor agnostic means it's matched to a biomarker that's typically going to be a, a protein that that uh, cancer cell um, overexpresses. And I, I mentioned um, those checkpoint inhibitors like Keytruda. Keytruda was approved in the US in 2016 I think for skin cancer, but then in 2017, it was approved in the US for all tumor types. So all like all cancer origins, if um, the patient has what's called MSI high, so micro satellite instability high, which means the cancer is quite mutated. Um, those of you familiar with this, um, when when you're like stage four cancer like me um the chance of being msi high is very low which kind of makes sense if you think about it because for early stage patients if they have highly mutated cancer it's very visible to the immune system likely to get good immune response uh, likely to get good treatment response unlikely to go on to late stage cancer in my case, when it was uh, my cancer was diagnosed, um, it was already stage four, and um, for stage for colon cancer, stage four, MSI high is I think like nine percent um, occurrence, usually something like that. Stage one colon cancer is considered to be higher, so there's like a clear drop off, right? Uh, and that, yeah, that drop off, unfortunately. Uh, matches to poor prognosis. So I'm, so I'm talking about um, treatment, or um, this is a, a type of adoptive cell therapy using various kinds of white blood cells that seems to get a reasonable response over many, many, many cancer types, not matched to a specific genetic mutation, not matched to a specific biomarker. And I'll explain why that is, because that kind of sounds a bit weird. Um, so I mentioned this is different from T cell therapy. 
although T cells are one of the type of cells used. It's also different from that CAR T cell therapy where the cells being put in your body are bought from a pharmaceutical company. So they're like, they're grown from a, a cell line, a commercial cell line, and then um, genetically engineered for you. The cell therapy done in Japan, at least the, the one I had, is autologous. So autologous means it's a Latin term meaning like from your body or from the body, I guess. And it's grown from your own white blood cells. So from a patient's point of view, you go to the clinic, um, some blood is removed. Now, if it's removed mm. like from your arm with a syringe, you can do some kinds of cell therapy, but not others, because just the number of the certain types of cells in like in your arm in a 25 millimeter sample of blood is very low. Um, so you can get the uh, NK cells, which are one of the types of cells that are used here. So the, the three types of cells used here are NK cells, T cells, and dendritic cells. I'll explain the role of those very briefly. Um, and then I'll, I will take your questions in, in just a minute. Um, so the blood is removed um, by a process called apheresis, which is a little bit like, um, it's a little bit like kidney dialysis. Like if, if you know someone who uh, goes to the hospital kind of once or twice a week or even has a dialysis machine at home. So apheresis, your blood is taken, but because you need quite a lot to get enough white blood cells, they return the blood that they don't need, right? So the machine takes your blood as it comes out into the machine, it's put in a centrifuge that's so spun around. Um, blood has four components. There's the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the plasma, and the platelets. And they all have different densities, which means when you spin it fast enough, it's going to separate out into the layers. And the aphasis machine in this case is set to drain away the white blood cells um, that it keeps and then gives gives you back the rest of your blood <laughs> um and this takes about an hour or something from the patient's point of view and the number of white blood cells taken is a lot more than in a like a normal blood test however it's still a very small number compared to the number in your body so it's not like there it's not like the process lessens your ability to fight cancer because you know you, you've got a load of white blood cells missing it's not that um then comes three weeks of waiting while your cells are kind of um grown and selected and trained and incubated in the lab and then after three weeks they are returned to you um but a vastly bigger number and also the lab has selected the most act like the most cytoactive ones. Um, and with the um, T cells, for example, with T cells, the vast majority of T cells are not um, cytotoxic, right? So um, fewer than um, 0. Point, I think it's fewer than 0.01% of T cells are able to attack a cancer cell. So um, this treatment, as I said, uses, um, well, broadly, it's three categories of white blood cells. So NK cells, T cells, and dendritic cells. Within those cells types, there are different subtypes. So like T cells, loads and loads of different types have been identified. So T cells attack cancer cells and also uh, viruses and bacteria. And they can only attack labeled cells. Dendritic cells, they look a bit like kind of octopus cells and they float around the body and they look for foreign cells and they will label them. Um, they look for dead and damaged 
cells and they grab them and the dendritic cells grab these dead and dying cells, take them to the lymph nodes where they meet up with the T cells. And basically now the T cells know what to go and find. But the very, very big difference is NK cells. So NK cells are far, 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 far more sophisticated white blood cell. And they can attack cells that are not labeled as cancer cells or not presenting an antigen or not labeled with a neoantigen. So this is very important for late stage patients because they are able to attack cells that they recognize as being cancer, but not because of the labeling. And as a late stage patient, many of the cancer cells that we have are these unlabeled ones. Another interesting point of NK cells is, um, so someone asked, uh, was it Al asked about, um, uh, yeah, so cancer spreading to the bone, so bone mets, and that's another reason why NK cells are good is the uptake in um, bone, either if it's um, mets from another cancer or if, it, if it's like a primary bone sarcoma, the yeah, uptake is good. Um, so in Japan, the response has been pretty good. Um, so I'm gonna take questions now, um, as many as you like, but I'm gonna first answer the questions in the chat. Um, so yeah, so Amit, yes, the uptake in bones is pretty good. Um, also does seem to cross the, um, like the various barriers in the body. So, um, good uptake in uh, if it's spread to peritoneum. Um, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of stuff with uh, using it for primary brain cancer, but also brain mets as well. Uh, results have been pretty good. Um, so Paul asks about um, this idea of of tumors being hot and cold. Um, so this is this is a, a term that you often see in the marketing lit literature and about hot tumor as being um a very like immunoresponsive and cold tumors not um in in japan yeah the results do seem to be quite good using this this mixture across all, so for example I, I you know my tumor is a uh, uh, mss a microsatellite stable uh the tumor mutation burden, which is a TMB, this is another like measure of the mutation rate. Um, mine is quite low. Um, my cancer, when it was found, was late, which uh, late stage, so probably quite a lot of immunosuppression. So yeah, for people with a so-called like cold um, tumors, uh, yeah, it does doesn't seem to be an issue. The, the hot and cold thing is is really when you talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, checkpoint inhibitors um, are drugs that inhibit checkpoints. Immune checkpoints are things that stop the body's immune system attacking cancer cells. Checkpoints are very 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 important because they stop your immune system attacking yourself. T cells have a tendency to attack um, the healthy tissue when overexcited. Uh, NK cells are very, very good at tissue discrimination. So with checkpoint inhibitor, like the media often describe it as removing the brakes on the immune system, which, which is a good um, analogy. But what they don't say is that if you're a late stage patient, you have a very poor immune system removing the brakes doesn't generally help. And that's why the checkpoint inhibitors give poor response for late stage patients in the treatment that I have in Japan. Um, you're getting a huge, huge number of extra white blood cells put in your blood. I mean, you know, uh, I think it's like a billion to one ratio or something typically. Um, but um, I'm going to look through the chat and answer the more questions. Well, while, while you're doing that, Matthew, let, let me jump in here. You know, <clears throat> But uh, with regard to the checkpoint inhibitors in combination uh, with this particular immunotherapy, I guess I'm really worried about hyperprogression because I've heard of that and I've seen data all over the place. And I know of one patient who went to Japan who, who experienced that. 
Well, no, who, 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 well let's, who claim, who, who thinks you? he, okay. Yeah. yeah, so he had heard the term hyper-progression. So I'll just explain hyper-progression. So first of all, hyper-progression is a theory, it's a theory um, attached to uh, these checkpoint inhibitors. So hyper-progression is this idea that for some patients, they, um, they get a lot of well, hyper progression in their tumor growth after receiving an immune checkpoint inhibitor um, like Keytruda or Optivo. This is, this is a theory and all the immunotherapists I've talked to, they, and, and a, a lot of the papers I've seen, they say um, that's what it looks like, but that's probably not what's happening. And what's really happening is that that the what you had was just the timing, and there's just a lot of tumor progression, uh, not, um, immunosuppression, right? So in when you when you think about you've got the cancer and you've got your immune system, and cancer does immunosuppression, so that means it generally weakens your immune system, particularly like the number of white blood cells produced. Um, that's one of the reasons why as cancer patients, we, we, uh, really struggle with infectious diseases and things like that. Cancer also does what's called immune escape, which means it's specifically able to avoid the immune response that's targeted at the cancer, right? So within those, there are many, many mechanisms of immunosuppression and one that you may have heard of, uh, a T regs, right? Regulatory T cells. So regulatory T cells, they are a type of cell that limits the activity of T cells so that the T cells don't, you know, attack your body um, and uh, kill you. So with those, you you can measure that in the in the peripheral blood test. And then if the regulatory C cells are very high, you can give a, a, a drug that will suppress them. Uh, regular chemo suppresses them as well. So you could, you could do a couple of doses of chemo before the treatment to suppress them. Um, so yeah, Roger, I mean, I've talked to a lot of immunotherapists and I've spent a long time looking into the hyper progression thing. Um, the, the, Immunotherapists that I've talked to believe that all you're really seeing is that the um, immunosuppression is, is winning and it's not drug induced at all. So you must also be careful. There's this other term, pseudo progression. And again, in some in some cases, what you may be seeing is pseudo progression. So pseudo progression is where it looks like the cancer is getting worse, but isn't. And this can be things like uh, tumor growth. So sometimes a, a patient will have a certain type of immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is very, very wide, many kind of types. Um, and the, the tumors may appear to get bigger. And the proposed mechanism for this is that it's because a lot of white blood cells are rushing in there and therefore the tumor is bigger on the scan. In the um, EU, they actually had to redo the um, like the protocols for clinical trials for immunotherapy drugs, um, because what was happening is patients were getting uh, immunotherapy when they're testing various kinds of immunotherapy, and the trial endpoints were always um, progression-free survival, which meant that when some patients were getting bigger tumors, they were then being kicked out of the trial, not monitored anymore, and years later were still doing okay. So this is pseudo progression. So yeah, it's a it's a very clouded issue, Roger. But it's the hyper progression thing is something a theory associated with checkpoint inhibitors. Um, it's not a theory that many immunotherapists seem to take seriously. It's far more unfortunately to do with this. The patient is on a trajectory of uh, tumor of um, immunosuppression, and that's what's happening. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to, there's lots of great questions coming yeah, in. So. You know, Matthew, one thing here, maybe you could talk about the NK expansion a little more or see as a question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, just put it in the chat, but if you have a question, if you can use the raise your hand function, um, and I will be happy to uh, oh, call excellent. on you so, yeah. so that we can work through this. Yeah. So um, so there's a question about um, the cell expansion. So cell expansion um, involves, first of all, selecting the like the more cytotoxic uh, cells among the white blood cells taken from the patient, and then essentially like letting the cells breed and grow. Um, but also, there are lots of things you can do to um, make them more likely to find and kill the cancer cells. So one thing um, that you can do is you may have a peptide available, so peptide, a protein, protein available that matches well to that ca cancer um, patient's cancer type, and you can incubate the uh, dendritic cells with that. Um, and that could be as general as, um, I mean, lots and lots of cancers produce this thing, uh, CEA. I mean, you may, you know, on the, your blood test, you may track CA as a biomarker. So a lot of cancers uh, express that on, on the cell surface uh, and you can get a CA targeted peptide. And it's just a commercial product that the immunotherapy lab is gonna order from their supplier and they'll use an incubation process. Um, another thing you can do is incubate this or I mean, this is not an either or like there are various things you can do and many of them you can combine and this is very much tailored to the patient right so you can um, do conditioning with heat shock proteins so when uh, cancers are damaged particularly by heat or when all cells are damaged by heat in fact they get heat shock proteins forming on the surface and again you can uh, you can get these. There are many, many kinds. They are categorized by their size, bizarrely. Um, so it, the, when you hear like uh, eight, um, HSP 70 that will, or HSP 90, be like a 70 nanometer heat shock protein. Um, and this can be used to improve the, the process. Um, dendritic cells only take about a week for optimal process. Uh, NK cells take around three weeks for, for optimal processing. Um, and the way they're processed is kind of important. So just a, on a very practical point, if you're going to do any kind of cell-based immunotherapy, I um, my, my very, very, very extremely strong recommendation is you only go to a clinic that does its own cell processing. So the clinic should own a cell processing lab and be doing their own processing so that they are being very um, kind of fanatical about the, the processing, right? You don't want your cells sent off somewhere, particularly sent across a border, for example, um, because, you know, you may get some overzealous person at uh, customs who open up the package see there's a yeah human um human cells put in some bleach in case there's a pathogen or whatever um so in europe for example uh, there's a whole bunch of immunotherapy clinics that sell send cells to greece for processing um i'm not going to comment on that specifically although i would say only go to an immunotherapy clinic that does its own processing um so I'm, I'm just looking through the chat because uh, excellent questions are coming in thick. Looks and like Amit has his hand up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, just a quick follow up on what we were talking about already, right? So you said kind of what the um, growing process is. So is it personalized uh, to the individual patient? What kind of biomarkers are checked for the individual patient? Can you talk a little bit about the personalization and what type of testing is required from patient for that? Yeah, so um, it's personalized as much as possible, depending on the patient. So, um, and, and that's evolving all the time as well, as more and more um, peptides, for example, become available that are matched to certain biomarkers. So 
Um, and and th this this goes into also some of the other things that can be done to improve the treatment that are not to do with the cell conditioning. So um, yeah, so the the personalization this is not um, like a full genome sequencing thing. It's very different from that because remember we're not talking about trying to target specific antigens. Um, because the problem with that is many, many of the cells are not presenting an antigen. Now you can, nowadays you can do neoantigen neo therapy as well. Um, but again, many of the cancer cells, particularly for late stage patients are not presenting uh, neoantigens either, right? Neoantigens are like um, antigens that are, are, um, are appearing as like part of the uh adaptive immune system not innate i believe um i'm not a doctor i'm not an immunotherapist but um yeah so as I, yeah as i've explained that some of the processing can be personalized and that can be based is is essentially based on just the blood analysis that they do so on um like essentially the day before you do your apheresis the lab is going to take a like a normal blood test but in the lab, they're going to be mainly looking at um, like white blood cell activity levels. Um, the measure for that is a, is actually a bit crude. They get some white blood cells from you. They put them in a, in a, a essentially in a beaker with some cancer cells that have had um, like a dye placed inside the cancer cells. And there's a uh, like an infrared sensor and, a, and an infrared source either side of the the device. It's not really a beaker; it's a bit more sophisticated than that. But as the white blood cells start attacking those cancer cells, the dye comes out. Less light passes through the light gate, um, and so you can get a measure of how um, active these cells are. So, so there's some kind of analysis that can be done, um, but this also feeds into like what else you can do to make the treatment work a bit better. So with colon cancer, for example, um, some of us are KVAS wild type, um, which means the cancer cells overexpress uh, epidermal growth factor receptor, I think it's called, which is but what makes your skin grow. Um, so quite a few cancers, the cancer cells overexpress that. That means you can use a targeted therapy called a panitumumab or um, uh, Herbitux, uh, um, cetuximab is the generic name. And so there's a pair of drugs and cetuximab is uh, only partially humanized. So it's got mouse DNA in. And that means your immune system recognizes it as like being a, list, a bit foreign. So with, um, with that, before the immunotherapy is administered to the patient, they can have a low dose of cetuximab and that will mark the cancer cells and essentially it will act a bit like a neoantigen and it will then be more visible to the T cells. Um, a similar thing is a uh, Herceptin. So Herceptin is a very famous uh, cancer drug for breast cancer for HER2 positive breast cancer. Turns out quite a lot of cancers are also HER2 overexpressive. So in that case, Herceptin would be would be good. So if if the testing um, reveals that a targeted drug um, would be useful for you as a cancer patient, and that can that targeted drug is partially humanized, then it can be used to enhance this immunotherapy. So, in the case of the the drugs I mentioned, um, panitumumab is fully humanized, so that wouldn't help; it'd be in, invisible. Um, so, I'm going to go through and see some more questions. Matthew, um, I've got my hand raised. I'm going to yeah. I'll jump in here. Yeah, please uh, do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have uh, on here some some sort of veterans in, in cancer across a few different segments. 
um, who have seen several different treatments, um, any sense of how uh, multiple treatments that can create uh, heterogeneity of the cancers, how this treatment works with um, with patients who have seen multiple treatments? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so there's this interesting thing, for example, about the hot, hot and cold tumors. So there's a lot of interest in, um, and I mean, specifically for the checkpoint inhibitors, can you turn cold tumors into hot tumors? Um, so for example, yeah, a lot, remember a lot of this, it's when we talk about these mechanisms, it's, it's, it's hundred percent guessing, a hundred percent guessing. You should be very, very skeptical of um, reports you see in the media where they say, you know, where where they're, they're sort of being very clear about this mechanism. This is all proposed guesswork. So, for example, um, with a liver, with a patient where the cancer spread to the liver, um, and it's um, a so-called cold tumor, there have been good um not exact yeah like kind of preclinical results treating those liver mets with radiofrequency ablation this seems to then sensitize um the cancer to checkpoint inhibitors Th this research was done it wasn't an animal study it was a hu human study but it was human tissue study right so it's using real tissue from real cancer patients but it was a tissue study in a lab the results were very, very um, uh, promising. Uh, I heard about that a few years ago, didn't hear anything after that. Again, with, with, I mean, there's so much interest at the moment with the checkpoint inhibitors because they are very uh, commercial. So you see a lot of these combo trials. So things like checkpoint inhibitor plus MEK inhibitor seem to be getting some good results with that. Um, so in, Again, I'm very familiar with the colon cancer world. So in colon cancer, uh, late stage patients, about 10% are MSI high and seem to naturally get good response from checkpoint inhibitors. With some of those combination treatments, they're getting an extra 10 percentage points on that. So they're getting like 20% response. Unfortunately for me, the extra 10% do not so far include patients where the cancer spread to the liver, which it has in my case. So maybe there's other mechanisms going on there. Um, Roger just makes some comment about Japan being um, far less expensive um, and quicker due to the FDA. I didn't, I didn't personally know about the FDA they, there, but I do know that in some countries, cancer treatment is very, very, very expensive. In Japan, um, it's not. I mean, it's that's to do with how the Japanese health system is regulated. It's to do with the buying power of Japan because there's a high population in a small space. Japanese people tend to live almost forever. So there's a lot of, of uh, elderly cancer patients. Um, so, yeah, Japan has a lot of buying power. Um, yeah. Uh, other good questions coming in at the moment? Let's see. Um, so I, I um, yeah. Matt, Matthew, Jump. I just I just want to get back. I think yeah, um, you were addressing maybe a question that was in the chat regarding um, hot and cold cancers. Um, my my question really was really more about um, cancer patients who have seen multiple treatments and yeah. and sort of like what the results uh, yeah. of that so, are if if there are any. Yeah. So so yeah. So so it's, that's what I was trying to say about the hot and cold treatments. Um, hot and cold tumors rather the yeah um i mean i i have had a lot of cancer treatment um i strongly 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 believe that i'm alive because of multiple treatments especially multiple treatments at the same time and especially choosing treatments that are not um going to trash my immune system too much um so for example um in japan with this um autologous adoptive cell therapy the best results tend to it seems that the best results are always in conjunction with other treatments 
So for example, I've had some of this um, immunotherapy in between chemo cycles, because in, in, uh, in that situation, um, the, the chemo is wiping out some of your white blood cells, which generally is a very bad thing. In this case can be a very good thing because then there's like um, more, it seems there's more tissue uptake. You're also wiping out some of those uh, regulatory T cells. Also, when you have a treatment like chemo or radiotherapy, that directly kills a lot of cancer cells. Those dead and dying cancer cells are hanging in your body over a period of time. So if you then have your dendritic cell therapy, there's just far more um, detritus floating around in your blood for the dendritic cells to find, right? So having this treatment just after radiotherapy, for example, um, a, a treatment I've used a lot over the years is regional hypothermia therapy. So this is a treatment where you heat uh, areas of the body and there seems to be a lot of immunotherapeutic effect from the heating and it seems to work particularly well with these um, three types of autologous um, therapy using T-cells, NK-cells and dendritic cells. There are lots of papers on that about proposed mechanisms. It is just guesswork. Um, but part of it does seem to be to do with these heat shock proteins. So when you heat um, tissue to like uh, so-called fever temperatures, so like 41, 42 degrees, something like that, over a sustained period of time, um, the cells get damaged. Part of the damage manifests as heat shock proteins on the surface of the cells. All, all the cells get damaged that are heated. It's not just the cancer cells, unfortunately. But as soon as the heat source is removed, um, the, within about 20 minutes, the self-repair starts. But cancer cells are quite poor at self-repair. So most of the cancer cells are still going to be covered in these heat shock proteins. And this seems to be something that Im the immune system can recognize. Um, another benefit um, with the hypothermia therapy is that you get increased blood flow for about 24 hours into the area of the body that was heated. So, I mean, this enhances chemotherapy, for example, but particularly we want the uh, injected immune cells to get where they need to go. So this is why you'll hear about um, certain immunotherapy clinics are doing immunotherapy where they like inject into the tumors um, getting very good results but that's a very invasive process it's not doesn't seem to be done in japan at the moment um the alternative the japanese have come up with um is that the um the dendritic cells um they inject in like between your ribs because there's loads of lymph nodes there um this is extremely painful. It, the pain only lasts for like a few seconds, but it's extremely painful. But that seems to get good results without having to like sedate the patient and inject right into the tumors, which, and of course that's not gonna be possible for many, many patients just because of where the tumors are located. Um, but yeah, so Brian, um, I absolutely, I mean, I have like four pillars of how to get long-term survival from cancer right so number one uh access the the new treatments as quickly as possible do not wait for the approval if the science seems sound and early results seem good go for it number two combination of treatments particularly at the same time right so this idea of like first line therapy second line third line therapy that's an economic thing disguised as medicine. That's unfortunately why we lose so many cancer patients. Third thing, which I really hate, is having a lot of treatment. I have done a lot of treatment, right? That's why I've managed seven and a bit years now, not seven months of life, right? Um, a, as much treatment as your body can take, which kind of suggests you should try and choose the combination of gentler treatments. Um, and the fourth thing is, is really 
try to choose treatments that cause less immunosuppression. Um, so like the specifics really count, right? So if you can have radiotherapy, loads of different kinds of radiotherapy at the moment, um, you look at the papers, which ones seem to cause the least bone marrow suppression. So that's going to be like, you know, choosing something like tomotherapy or proton beam therapy instead of the old school Linac therapy where, you know, if the blast a uh, high dose of radiation, um, you're irradiating all your, your bone marrow. <laughs> um, yeah, so Brian, absolutely multiple treatments, as much treatment as you can manage. Uh, I, I can't wait for the new treatments. I just have to, you know, access what's out there. And above all, you know, I just see that all long-term survival comes from immune response. Um, whether that's a treatment induced or some amazingly fortunate genetics. I mean, and, and I mean, you see this coming out again and again and again now when people talk about chemotherapy, where the the papers are like saying, you know, an un, unusual response. We believe this must have been a uh, chemo induced immune response, right? Because the chemotherapy, yes, it's suppressing your immune system, but also it's killing a bunch of cancer cells which means the immune system can see that but also you're reducing the immunosuppression because there are fewer cancer cells there to suppress the immune system so, um, so i just i have one question then um i, I see that Ahmed yeah. has a question but just to follow up so in your seven-year journey when did you actually get this treatment like at year five year six yeah. so, and how you know how yeah, yeah yeah so um i first got this treatment just after my surgery uh, seven years ago. Okay. So early. Um, so because I, because I'm in Japan, um, I've had this treatment several times spread out a small amount each time. Mm. That's for economic reasons, partly, but also because I, I mean, I'm an, I'm an hour away from the clinic when international patients come the, and, and I mean, the clinic is changing the protocol all the time based on results, but what they found tends to work well for international patients is to do like five days of treatment. So typically, you know, on day one, you'd have your standard blood testing and some analysis. Day two, you'd have that apheresis process where the cells are collected. Then you've got your three weeks of waiting you don't need to be in Japan for that um, or don't need to be where the clinic is. Um, although I, you know, I should emphasize that international travel does take a lot of toll on your body, a lot, lot more than we think. Um, there's probably interesting mechanisms about that, but um, if you're ever considering treatment anywhere far away, please do consider that. <laughs> um, it does. Yeah. International travel takes a big toll. And then, um, coming back for like essentially a week of treatments every day. So I have not had like a week of intensive treatment. I've had treatments spread over time. Um, also with the dendritic cell therapy, if frozen tumor tissue is available, this can be used um, essentially like the tissue can be cut up, put with some conditioning stuff and used to improve the conditioning of the dendritic cells to be very, very, very highly targeted to your cancer cells. Um, people get very, very confused because they think I'm talking about something similar to like neoantigen therapy. This is not that. This is not testing the tissue, doing a genome sequence, and then matching that to neoantigen therapy. This is physically using the tumor tissue to condition the dendritic cells and last year we saw an amazing result from that for primary brain cancer um i mean this is a very very hard thing to do a trial on because a surgeon is not going to agree to open you up just because you'd like some tumor tissue um this can't be done with um pickled tumor tissue so it can't be done with something set in formaldehyde you can use that for genetic testing that's fantastic but you can't use it for this. But there was um, a trial, multi-center trial, primary brain cancer, and they got double um, the overall survival. Um, and this is 
for people with primary brain cancer where the prognosis is very very poor and ve a very um small number number of treatments available and the the trial was just done with primary brain cancer because not because it there was any belief it would work um especially well for primary brain cancer this is an agnostic treatment but just because those patients have such poor prognosis and um so few treatments available um so we expect that if you were able to do that kind of trial for other cancers you'd get exactly the re results there doesn't seem to be any differentiation and this a lot of this comes down to the sophistication of the white blood cells compared to a commercial immunotherapy product that's just targeting one thing and can't evolve and anything like that um yeah. Okay. I um, have a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. I can I can just uh, kind of ask uh, of course, uh, Matthew. So, yeah. So so one thing about you know you talked about the heating and how heating kind of helps with uh, immunotherapy. Um, you know, similarly, other doctors use cryoabation. Yeah. Um, when they do that, so do you have it, does heating work better than you know cooling or cryoablation or vice versa? So, so, so first of all, I I just like to make a general comment about cryoablation and uh, the heating one, radio frequency ablation. Um, I, I'm not a doctor, this is not medical advice, but I think it is absolutely criminal how underused these treatments are. Absolutely criminal. Mm -hmm. because, because from a patient's point of view, what is amazing about, I mean, forget about maybe they help with immunotherapy or other. what is amazing about these treatments is we get multiple bites of the apple if you have rfa or cryoablation and you get limited response or poor response you can have it again <laughs> right so yes there are economic issues around that um if you have it and you get no response you then may still better go on and do the surgery Right. So so just as a general comment, I think it's absolutely disgusting oh, like that these treatments are not like just used as much as humanly possible. Right. Um, and just I will give a, a 20 second anecdote. Um, I had a, a lung tumor, right lung, lung tumor, and went to talk to the surgeon. He was saying, you know, he could um, take it out, essentially 100 percent chance of success, wedge resection, little keyhole surgery and radiotherapist oh about 80 percent chance of success with tomotherapy and of course the surgeon you know 100 percent chance and, and i said to the surgeon if i have this tomotherapy and it doesn't work can you still do the surgery and he kind of ummed and ahed a bit and said well yeah actually that would still be no problem i went for the radiotherapy because it's far less invasive in my case it worked completely um, but that's very interesting because like it's like an economic thing disguised as a medical thing, right? Um, yeah. I've not. I've but, not. Seen but heat the, versus heat versus cold. Are there is there data to say one works better than the other? I I have not seen. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've looked around for comparisons, and a mm -hmm. third one that I think is really worth looking into if you can access it is HIFU, H I F U. Mm -hmm high intensity focused ultrasound um so this is again is going to meant to be like a drop-in replacement for radiotherapy right just like you know rfa was um so you're using high intensity ultrasound to ablate the tumors but again it's going to be um if it if it gets you a small response you may have been that multiple times if it doesn't work um it hasn't suppressed your immune system it hasn't trashed your liver or whatever you can go and have the other treatments you can yeah. go and do your surgery um mm -hmm. yeah can you talk a little bit about the clinic that you and roger have used like sure you know, so, how many so as i said like this? yeah and I mean, uh you know how many doctors practice this so um i'm i'm only familiar with literally the the clinic that i've been to um i went there a lot because I actually went there every week for five years, not for the immunotherapy. That would take more money than there is in the world, probably. But um, for, for the hypothermia therapy, because for bizarre reasons, I'm not going to go into, even though it's an experimental treatment, it's covered by Japanese national health insurance. Um, so, 
yeah, I can connect you to the clinic that I went to. Um, again, my email address is in the chat. Um, they, the clinic, so the clinics and hospitals in Japan generally do not take international patients directly. You go through what's called a medical travel assistance company. This is the same for lots of Asian countries. I, I don't know outside of Asia. Um, however, partly because I went there every week for five years, um, I can directly introduce um, patients. And you know, if you're interested, I can uh, set up an on online consultation with the immunotherapist there. Um, so this is a, a a small clinic in Tokyo um, with. I think, I mean, they, they, they work like as it, with a network of other clinics. So one of the things they are involved in is this metronomic chemotherapy where you have a low dose of chemotherapy, but with no breaks, like continuously at, at, to all, like this has to be tablet based chemotherapy. And that seems to have a good immunotherapeutic effect. So they, they work with like a metronomic chemotherapy clinic. Um, the, the doctor, the main immunotherapist who set up the clinic, uh, Dr. Teranuma, he is the pioneer of immunotherapy in Japan. He seems to be the world leader for NK cell therapy. Um, he was writing papers about it kind of, um, well, he was, I mean, he's writing papers about certain aspects of it 10 years ago that now the medical world are kind of making a big fuss about like uh, the communication between NK cells and dendritic cells that there seems to be this um, like NK cells seem to give a very surprisingly long response like benefit over years um, with the dendritic cells when you have dendritic cell therapy um, it seems that you get more T cell activity for almost like six months afterwards so th this is kind of really long lasting effects we're talking about um it's not like the kind of the, the, the more like drug-based immunotherapy where you get a big blast and then um the only long-term thing you get is the side effects um this is not that you know i i do have to say that this stuff is is personalized and therefore very expensive although i i talk to a lot of american cancer patients and they're they're like asking if I've missed off the zero or whatever in the pricing. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, see, I'm not joking. So, I mean, several have actually asked if there's a zero missing because the standard intensive treatment is going to be around twenty five thousand um, dollars. You know, I'm British where healthcare is free at the point of use, so it's very hard for me to understand paying for health treatment. I, I, it's beyond mm -hmm. beyond my little brain um but apparently in america yeah i mean you you may pay hundreds of thousands of dollars um now that twenty five thousand dollars that would be the basic kind of um some yeah the, the standard conditioning and there would be add-ons to that i mean you know an extra thousand dollars for a, some kind of pre-treatment for example um you know if you want them to store your cells for a year so that you can come back and get some more that might be another thousand dollars um still i mean we're talking about yeah what feels like a so huge amount the, of money for me but yeah it, so it's the same um clinic that roger has used me he has given me the contact information for sure the yeah and okay. yeah if you, if you drop me an email um okay. yeah I, I can i can send you the patient questionnaire and stuff and and you know uh just if, if you want an online consultation and any details about like the practical points of coming to Japan. Sure. I mean, um, you know, for most of us at the moment, th there's no need for like a health treatment visa or anything like that. It, you know, it, generally you'd be in Tokyo for about four weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, but I'm, I mean, I'm happy to take any more questions. I know we're kind of, the time is up. But... Yeah. I was just going to say, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording if there's sure. another question or two. So I'm going to stop it now.